a symposium, so I'm going to try to run it in a business-like manner and uh, keep it on schedule. Uh, and I know you're here to listen to the speakers and not to me, so I'm going to keep my remarks brief. The George A. Leet Business Law Symposium Endowment was established in 1999 to provide a national forum on business law at this law school. George Leet graduated from Adelbert College in 1940 and from this law school in 1946. He spent almost his entire career with the National Labor Relations Board Ending his tenure there as Senior Associate Executive Secretary, he retired in 1980 and died in 2006. George Leet was a generous supporter of Case Western Reserve University for many years. In 1998, he received its Newton D. Baker Distinguished Alumnus Award for Exceptionally Meritorious Service. I hope that this symposium is an adequate memorial to his vision and leadership. The theme of this year's symposium is executive compensation, which has become the most contentious issue in corporate governance. Many claim that poorly designed executive compensation incentives helped cause the recent financial collapse, but critics disagree widely about what was wrong with those designs. Some also claim that many American executives are overpaid that their pay reflects their own influence over boards rather than a disinterested evaluation of their worth. Management and investors are wrestling over their roles in structuring executive compensation through say on pay and over the role of proxy advisory services. This symposium brings together prominent practicing attorneys, institutional investors, proxy advisors, and business and legal scholars to discuss the current issues and where we are or should be headed. Uh, one note, uh, the titles for the three panels on your program were uh, chosen quite arbitrarily because our administrators asked me for some titles. <laughs> uh, I got the best speakers in the field and I've asked them to discuss whatever they think is important and interesting, so uh, will not necessarily correspond to the titles uh, on your uh, program. The moderator for our first panel is Mitch Thompson, who holds his JD summa cum laude and an LLM in taxation from this law school. He is a partner in the taxation and benefits group of Squire Sanders, and he will introduce the speakers for our first panel. Mitch. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dent. And uh, welcome, everybody. Um, our first panel today is, uh, rightly or wrongly, entitled Corporate Executives, Are They Overpaid? And we have a terrific, terrific panel of speakers leading academics in this area. I'm going to introduce all three, and then uh, they'll take their turns at this podium. Uh, we're joined today by Jesse Fried, who's a professor of law at Harvard Law School and co-author of the book, Pay Without Performance, The Unfulfilled Promise of Executive Compensation. Also by Todd Henderson, who's a professor of law at the University of Chicago. Todd worked at McKinsey and & Company and at the law firm Kirtland & Ellis before becoming an academic. And lastly, by Jill Fish, who's the Perry, Gol Perry Golkin Professor of Law and co-director of the Institute for Law and Economics at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I'm going to start with Jesse. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank George for convening this symposium and um, uh, to you for uh, coming to uh, hear our presentations. So when I'm given a uh, topic for presentation, I, I, I take it very seriously. So the uh, <coughs> um, presentation today will be uh, an argument that 
uh, corporate executives are uh, still overpaid. And I'm going to provide three reasons why one should believe that uh, CEOs are systematically overpaid. The first is the, the economic logic of managerial power and director incentives. Um, <coughs> basically, the point here is that directors are paying executives with other people's money, and they're susceptible to all sorts of influence uh, from the CEO. The evidence indicating that there's a link between the amount of managerial power. Can people hear me in the back? OK. The amount of managerial power and pay, and the widespread camouflaging of pay, which would not arise if, uh, <coughs> if pay was being negotiated on an arm's length basis. So first, I'm going to talk about the logic of managerial power and director incentives. So there's sort of an official view of executive pay, um, which is that uh, boards bargain at arm's length with CEOs. Uh, CEOs are human. They want the, um, <coughs> the most pay possible. They want to have pay that is the most decoupled from their own performance as possible. Uh, but the directors are loyal agents of the shareholders. They bargain hard with the CEOs, and they craft pay arrangements that are designed to properly compensate and incentivize CEOs. So on this view, the CEO uh, uh, pay market is like any other type of market. So this is basically the official view of CEO pay negotiations. You have two parties haggling as if it were their own money over the price of a good or service. And I'll let you imagine which of these is the CEO and which is the director. OK, so this official view uh, is very pervasive. It underlies most financial economists' work on the subject. It's used to justify boards' compensation decisions to shareholders, policymakers, and courts. And if it were correct, then we would conclude that CEOs are not systematically overpaid. But there's a problem with this official view. Um, it is reassuring and neat, but it doesn't really ac account for what happens uh, in the boardroom. In order, to, in order to understand what's happening in these pay negotiations, we have to look at not only the incentives of the CEO, but also the incentives of the directors. And we can't assume that they are automatically going to act in the interests of shareholders. So here are some reasons why we should be uh, skeptical of a claim that directors are going to bargain at arm's length, and why we should believe that they are very likely to favor executives. First, we'll look at their economic incentives. So <clears throat> if you go along with the CEO, um, you are more likely to be renominated to the board. Even though the CEO no longer sits on most nomination committees, um, uh, if you tangle with the CEO, you're likely to upset your fellow board members, <coughs> less likely to be renominated. You're also less likely to be nominated to other boards. 99% of board elections are not contested, which means in order to get on a board, whether it's that company's board or some other company's board, uh, the uh, board nominating committee has to nominate you. The CEO also has lots of power to reward directors in various ways, um, <coughs> some of them subtle, some not so subtle. So when we had the recent um, blow up at JP Morgan, where uh, it turned out that one of their traders took a lot of risks, attention focused on the risk management committee of JP Morgan. Who was sitting on the risk management committee of JP Morgan? the president of the Museum of Natural History in New York. What was her qualification to sit on the risk committee of a bank? Zero. Um, <clears throat> how did uh, Jamie Dimon make sure that she would not raise too many tough questions? Well, he gave, or he had J.P. Morgan take some of the shareholders' money and give it to the Museum of Natural History. Why was she put on the board? Because she has a history of being on boards on risk committees and not asking questions. She was also on the risk committee of AIG, which also gave uh, the Museum of Natural History lots of money. So there are various ways that CEOs can undermine the, um, <coughs> I should say, further undermine the independence of directors. 
Then there are social factors, putting aside the fact that from a financial point of view, it's better for directors not to raise a ruckus. Um, it's very hard for people on boards who are working closely with a CEO on various issues uh, as a team once a year to turn around and negotiate with one of those people at arm's length. It's hard to negotiate with your friend at arm's length. There are also a lot of people sitting on boards who have benefited from a system uh, that has, uh, that has uh, provided uh, high levels of pay that's not necessarily linked to performance. And they are not going to uh, look very deeply at the compensation arrangement of the CEO of their company uh, and the potential problems with it if they themselves have benefited from that system. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, what are the costs to directors of overpaying uh, executives? Almost zero. They're paying with other people's money. It's not like that seen in the market, whether the people are haggling over some green vegetables. The person who's buying the green vegetables is paying with their own money. The directors on boards are not paying with their own money. They're paying with other people's money. They own tiny, tiny fractions of the company's equity. So for a typical director, if you overpay a CEO by $10 million just to take a, a, an arbitrary number, it would cost the director $500. So basically, uh, <clears throat> there's no financial cost to them of overpaying. And CEOs tend to uh, pick uh, pliant directors for their boards. Uh, and then once they're on the boards, they're subject to all of these influences. Um, so <clears throat> Warren Buffett is always good for a good quote. Uh, he wrote in 2009, in the last 40 years, the CEO has, an, has had an important role determining their own compensation. These people pick their own compensation committees. They aren't looking for Dobermans. They're looking for Cocker Spaniels. It's been a system that the CEO has dominated. In my experience, boards have done little in the way of thinking through as an owner what they ought to pay these people, and that makes perfect sense from basic economic logic, because the directors are not paying with their own money, and they're susceptible to these other influences. So, the same factors that prevent arm's length bargaining give CEOs power over their boards, and they use this power to um, <clears throat> influence their own pay. They get pay that's higher than we would see prevailing if there were true arm's length bargaining, uh, and it's more performance decoupled than it would be if there were true arm's length bargaining. So <clears throat> there is some variation in the amount of power that American CEOs have. Um, all CEOs have some power, but some have more than others. And there are a number of studies which show that as the power of the CEO increases, they get more pay. So uh, the larger the board is, which means that the, you know, the more diffuse responsibility is, the less likely it is that any director is going to take his job seriously, the higher his pay. The, more, the busier that directors are, the more outside activities they have, the higher his pay. Um, the more directors there are who've been appointed by the current CEO, the higher is the CEO's pay. Uh, the absence of a 5% block holder who might exert some disciplining influence, the higher is CEO pay. Uh, looking at institutional investors, some institutional investors are captured by management because they're hoping to sell services to management, some aren't. If you look at um, what are termed to be pressure resistant institutional investors, those who don't have any potential conflict, um, if you don't have any of them, the higher is CEO pay. When states pass anti-takeover laws, an exogenous shock to the system, which should make the CEO's job more secure and should reduce the amount of money you have to pay him, no, the higher is CEO pay, et cetera. Okay, so the third part of the argument is that there, there are systematic attempts to hide from shareholders how much CEOs are paid. Um, <clears throat> and the reason why boards want to hide how much CEOs are paid from shareholders is to um, reduce shareholder outrage, which could pose a threat to them. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to take you back in a time machine to before 1992, before um, the SEC began requiring companies to report CEO compensation and summary compensation tables. The reason why the SEC required companies to report compensation and summary compensation tables is that since the 1930s, companies have been required to disclose the compensation to top executives. 
But before the summary compensation table system was introduced, what companies would do is they would disclose the pay that the CEO was being given by writing it out in words rather than in numbers in their uh, you know, 50 page proxy disclosure. Why were they writing, out, writing it out in words rather than numbers? So someone who was looking through it couldn't quickly see how much the CEO was being paid. You'd have to invest several hours reading through the document to see that the CEO was paid $4 million, you know, $500,000 or $3,500,000. And you couldn't figure out what CEOs were being paid, even if you could get to those numbers, because everything was all jumbled up deliberately. So the SEC said, OK, we're going to put in place these summary compensation tables where uh, firms have to uh, uh, put in dollar amounts or other values for different types of pay. Uh, that was in 1992. After 1992, what we saw is that companies started shifting to um, various forms of pay that did not have to be reported in the summary compensation table, like SERPs, all sorts of retirement-related payouts. Heavy shift towards SERPs. Um, there was also an attempt to move items from one column to another in the summary compensation table. So shareholders don't like it when CEOs get paid high salaries because it's clearly not dependent on performance. So what companies would do is they would give guaranteed bonuses, okay? So that they would that could be put in the in the bonus uh, in the bonus column of the summary compensation table and not in the salary table. What is a guaranteed bonus? It's salary. It's money you're going to get, you know, whatever happens. So in part because of some, uh, some uh, work that I did looking at uh, executive pensions with Lucian Bebchuk, in 2006, the SEC fixed the summary compensation table to try to capture the, um, to try to capture the amount of value that was accruing to direct, uh, to uh, executives uh, through SERPs and, um, it seems that that may have reduced the use of this form of compensation, which from, from an economic perspective doesn't make much sense, but it was being used to, uh, to camouflage pay. Um, <coughs> after the 2006 reforms, it was discovered that thousands of American companies had been uh, backdating stock option grants, which is a way of hiding the amount of compensation that's being um, given to uh, executives. Um, the most egregious case was United Health, where the CEO had to pay back $500 million of excess compensation uh, to the company. There were also um, many instances of executives <coughs> backdating option exercises and spring-loading grants. They got less attention than option grant backdating because they were uh, less uh, common and the stories were not as juicy, but there was a widespread attempt on the part of executives and directors to hide what CEOs were getting. So all of this secret compensation is hard to reconcile with an arm's length story that CEOs are getting paid fairly in arm's length negotiation and it suggests that the parties have something to hide. So I've been working on this, uh, on this topic for about uh, 10 years, sparring with various economists as to um, as to uh, whether managerial power plays a role in executive pay. And I'm pleased to say, uh, after reading two recent pieces by uh, two of our very worthy adversaries uh, in this debate, that they have come around to the view that managerial power does play a role in the setting of executive pay. Uh, Kevin Murphy, who with um, Michael Jensen uh, wrote seminal articles back in the 1990s about how we should increase uh, the degree to which CEOs were paid for performance, um, <coughs> writes in a recent survey, what makes CEO pay complicated is that the efficient contracting, managerial power, and political paradigms coexist and interact. I completely agree with what he has written uh, there. And Steve Kaplan of the University of Chicago um, basically uh, indicates that he agrees with, uh, with Murphy's assessment, that managerial power does play a role, and to the extent that managerial power does play a role, it means that CEOs are being overpaid. So there's no real debate as to whether CEOs are overpaid on average. Uh, the only question is, by how much? That's the end of my remarks.
Thank you, Professor Freed. And um, we, mindful that this is a webcast, if there are questions or comments, please um, indicate your interest in doing so and we'll get you either a microphone to you or get you to a microphone. And let me pull up, which is your, mm. is it case talk? Yeah. All right. Oh, that's cute. Great. Thank you. And next is Todd Henderson from the University of Chicago. Professor Henderson. Thank you for having me. Uh, my family's originally from Ohio, so it's always good to be back in, uh, in Ohio, uh, even though I'm from Pittsburgh. <laughs> uh, I, could, I could agree uh, with what Jesse said, but that would be no fun, so I'm, I'm going to disagree. Um, I think everything he said is right, so I guess I'm with Kaplan and uh, Murphy that surely uh, managerial power must explain some parts of executive compensation, that executives try to get everything they can and are going to try to manipulate things as much as possible. Sure, I guess that's right. Um, the claim in their book, which uh, was uh, hugely influential and deservedly so, was that this was a pervasive and systematic uh, phenomenon that explained the pay practices we see and that pay was not linked with performance. Uh, I don't think that's uh, uh, right or evident from the data. Sure, there are going to be uh, cases in which people are overpaid and, uh, and uh, to deny so would be uh, silly. Uh, the question is whether or not it is a significant problem and if it is a significant problem, because uh, we could cite lots of evidence to show that pay and performance are as tightly linked for CEO pay as they ever have been. If it is a significant problem, what do we do about it? Who decides what, how much CEOs should be paid? Because even if we were to conclude that CEOs are overpaid or are camouflaging the suggestion, replacing them with the Harvard Law School faculty or <laughs> some judges uh, who have their own strange incentives may not be a welfare improvement. So even though we're not in the first best efficient world, we might be in the best world that we could possibly inhabit. Interestingly, and, and this, uh, my first slide just points out that this is not the kind of conversation that the New York Times has, right? The New York Times or the average, if this came up in the vice presidential debate last night, we would have seen lots of yelling and screaming and we would have seen a, uh, some ratio of CEO pay to worker pay. This silly metric found its way into the Dodd-Frank bill, for goodness sakes, uh, a completely and utterly meaningless uh, statistic. Uh, I'm sure the ratio between a uh, Hollywood actor and the average makeup artist has also increased dramatically, but I don't really know what I should make of that. Uh, in academics like uh, Professor Freed and uh, his co-author Lucian Bebchuk, probably the two most influential um, law academics in the field, and, and rightfully so, uh, are, are focused on things like uh, inefficiencies. Are they efficiently paid? Not, not how much, as, as they flatly say in their book, and I think they're right. Who if they make $100 million a year, I don't really care. I care if they're paid uh, for performance. Okay, as uh, uh, Professor Fee just went through, uh, this, these uh, various factors, social and psychological factors, cognitive biases that may be operating in boards, and he cited some anecdotes, and there's lots of evidence that this is certainly true. Uh, if ever I'm given the opportunity, I hope to be on a board and fall right into the uh, cartoon characteristic. Um, but I want to look at two specific things that they've focused on very quickly. Uh, the first one here is a sort of empirical prediction that they would make. Uh, they say these things are uh, systematic and they point in their book to lots of features of CEO pay contracts that they say are self-evidently inefficient. A board would never agree to these five features of a CEO pay contract because they're just stupid. They're just, there's no way you would reasonably agree to that. And the fact that boards do agree to that suggests that managerial power is at work. So they find things that they think are uh, bogus or silly or wrong. Uh, and then uh, they uh, say the evidence of those things suggests managerial power, not efficiency. The other one that I'm going to look at quickly is about camouflage. They use as one of their examples of camouflage the existence of insider trading profits, which they say boards don't take account of, uh, and therefore this is a uh, sign of uh, camouflage. Uh, 
as you can see, it's difficult to explain from an optimal, optimal contracting perspective. That is, that boards don't take these into consideration. Okay, so I'm going to just look at these very quickly. Uh, two papers that I've done, uh, which I'll uh, try to summarize as fast as possible. The first one is their claim that managerial power explains the features of compensation contracts. So I wanted to look at a situation in which managerial power was very low, maybe the lowest. Uh, I can imagine two such situations. One is when a uh, firm is uh, suffering from financial distress. The reason is, in a typical firm, the reason managerial power is possible is because shareholders are uh, in Topeka, Kansas, holding a few shares. It's not worth it for them to invest in monitoring the company. But what happens when the dispersed shareholders are all then put back into one person or a couple of people, right? So instead of millions of shareholders and a board that's uh, composed of people from the Natural History Museum, what happens when one guy owns the firm? And that's what happens in a typical bankruptcy case. As a firm approaches financial distress, the firm is bought up. All of the interests in the firm are usually put in the hands of a couple of investors, vulture investors. And these guys have very strong incentives to turn the firm around and hire the right person to be the CEO, negotiate a CEO pay contract that will give that person very good incentives to get the firm turned around. So bargaining uh, mm. happens. I was a, when I was a consultant, I was uh, an advisor to some venture, vulture uh, capital funds in the takeover of distressed entities. And I can assure you, item one on their list of priorities was finding the right person to run the firm and making sure that person had the right incentives going forward. So I looked at about 80 of firms that suffered financial distress. I got the CEO pay contracts from these firms. And I looked to see whether or not the features of these CEO pay contracts were different than the ones that professors uh, Bebchuk and Freed uh, suggest self-evidently show the existence of managerial power. And not to my surprise, none of the things that they said were uh, obviously the product of a board suffering under the mind control of the CEO changed in the new contract. So the vulture company, vulture investors come in, they, the, uh, their, the uh, CEO's contract, if it existed before, is a, called an executory contract in bankruptcy. It's null and void. They write a new contract fresh on a clean slate. And there's no obvious reason, to me at least, why they would write a contract that was a managerial power contract when they're attracting somebody new to be hired to the board. Okay, that's a long study that I've summarized in, in three minutes. Another one of these is, um, the, or the second thing I want to talk about is uh, about insider trading profits. Professors Bebchuk and Fried say, boards don't bargain about insider trading profits. CEOs are earning lots of money trading in, in their uh, firm stock, and the board doesn't take this into consideration when setting pay. Okay, so it's obvious that um, investors sell lots of stock. I mean, CEOs sell lots of stock, billions of dollars, as I say here. And there are two things that they can get by uh, two values from selling shares. The first is what I call optimization trades. Their portfolio is something that they're constantly trying to optimize. They've got a mix of cash and securities and other um, uh, wealth in their portfolio. And if they can't trade, that is the securities are illiquid, then they're worth less because they might need it. Uh, they might need the cash. The other one is the obvious benefit from insider trading, that is, you have some information and you want to time the market. So both of these things exist. And a paper by a guy named Darren Rulestone found that when he was looking at companies that restricted the ability of insiders to trade by imposing so-called blackout windows, you're not allowed to trade near earnings announcements, for instance, what he found is that pay uh, increased. That boards, when they said to the CEOs, you're not allowed to trade during certain times of the year, they had to compensate them for that lack of liquidity by paying them more. That is both consistent with a bargaining theory of insider trade of uh, executive pay and with Professor Fried and Bebchuk's view because of course the CEO, when faced with a opportunity to go to the board and say, hey, you should pay me more, they're going to take advantage of it. So what I do is I look at the opposite case to test which of these theories is more likely to be true, the arm's length or the, uh, the uh, managerial power, by looking at the case where boards now don't restrict the ability to trade, but they liberalize the ability to trade. The CEO passed a rule uh, in 2000 uh, 
called Rule 10b-5-1, which allowed firms, uh, executives, to trade more often. They could enter into so-called pre-commitment trading plans. They could agree to trade sometime in the future, and as long as they committed to those when they didn't have inside information, that allowed them to trade during these blackout windows. They were effectively an SEC rule that allowed them to unwind blackout windows. So what I do is look at the pay for uh, CEOs who use these plans. And in prior work, um, uh, uh, Jag Alan Jagelinzer and uh, Carl Muller and I showed that people who disclosed these plans, and I won't go into this, uh, I'm happy to answer questions about this, but <laughs> firms that disclose these plans uh, were insiders who profited more from insider trading. Okay, so there's two groups of people, uh, people who are uh, disclosing the existence of these pre-commitment plans and people who are not disclosing the existence. And the people who are disclosing the existence of these plans, kind of counterintuitively, we called it hiding in plain sight, they earned more profits by trading in their company stock. So if I'm right that boards are bargaining about pay, what we'll see there at the bottom is that firms that are disclosing the existence of these trading plans will pay their CEOs less because those CEOs are earning more from insider trading. Okay, so we look at uh, pay at the disclosure firms and we predict that the firms that are disclosing the existence of these plans, they're expected to earn more in insider trading, their pay will be, uh, uh, will be um, uh, change less than the firms who do not disclose. And what I'm looking at is the change in pay from the time these plans are adopted. So a CEO goes to his board and says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna adopt a plan to trade, insider trade, and I'm gonna disclose this plan. The board then, in my kind of cartoon model, says, okay, we know you're going to be profiting from insider trading, and so we need to pay you less, right? Because what we need to do is satisfy your uh, sort of reservation wage, and we can do that with some mix of what we pay you and how much you can earn by trading in the market. So I've got something like uh, 700 firms here, and what we find is, uh, exactly as uh, the sort of arm's length bargaining suggests, boards whose CEOs are more likely to be trading and earning profits in insider trading increase the pay of those uh, um, CEOs less than companies where the CEOs are not expected to earn as much insider trading. And it's only natural. If the board expects you to be earning uh, money from the market, they don't need to pay you as much. So here's just an example uh, of the data, which I do some regressions and uh, do some more sophisticated analysis. But uh, this is the difference between the disclosure and the non-disclosure firms. And the blue uh, bars are the performance difference. So compare the performance of the disclosure firms and the non-disclosure firms, and then declare, uh, check the pay of the disclosure firms and the non-disclosure firms. These bars should be on the same line. Right? CEOs who, are, who have better performing companies uh, should get paid more. Right? And what I find is the opposite. To test whether or not this is a legitimate um, observation, I looked in the period, I did the same analysis in the period before the SEC rule. What was the same companies, how did their pay and performance link in the years prior to 2000 when the SEC promulgated this rule and insiders couldn't trade as much and the pay and performance were extremely highly correlated. These bars were on the same line. The companies who did better, their CEOs got more pay the next year. The CEO, the companies who did worse, they saw decreases in their pay. But when this rule is passed and it allows insiders to trade more, pay and performance get decoupled in a sense because the CEOs are substituting pay they can earn trading in the market. There's some other robustness things which I won't uh, talk about. The other thing I did is sort of a back of the envelope calculation to see whether or not this was sort of uh, approximately offsetting the amount the, invest the uh, insiders would expect to earn in the market. And you can see from here, uh, this table at the bottom shows the cumulative sales. Uh, that's six and a half million dollars for the non-disclosure group, about uh, seven, six or seven million dollars for the, the disclosure group. That's the, the combination of the last two uh, columns. So they're selling about eight million dollars in shares. 
From my prior paper, I showed the expected return under these plans is about 12%, which is about a million dollars in extra profit they're earning in a year. And the regression coefficient I get for the difference uh, in expected pay uh, based on disclosure is about a million dollars. Now, I'm not at all confident that this is right, but it was, I think, reassuring to me that this number was approximately uh, in the ballpark because if they were offsetting the pay by just a few dollars, that would say that uh, managerial power was uh, much more effective. Interestingly, and contrary to what um, was said about governance, corporate governance has no effect. Uh, I look at the things that Professor Fried mentioned, the presence of institutional shareholders and blockholders and things like that, and find that has no explanation, no explanatory power here. The firms with institutional shareholders, their insiders, are, their CEOs are insider trading in informed fashion just as much as uh, other companies. Okay, so the bottom line from uh, my remarks is not to suggest that managerial power doesn't explain anything. It doesn't explain um, I, uh, or that it's not a possible explanatory factor in every case or maybe, uh, maybe just a few cases, but to suggest that uh, when we look at situations in which there isn't managerial power, we don't see the, the uh, implementation of the self-evident reforms that uh, critics of managerial pay suggest, suggesting uh, who's better positioned to make these determinations than the board. Could we really make a welfare improvement by having uh, professors or judges uh, deciding CEO pay? Uh, and then to suggest that there is some evidence, some evidence of uh, board bargaining, both when CEOs are restricted in their ability to trade and when they're liberalized. Thank you. Professor Henderson, when, yeah. when you looked at distressed companies as kind of a proxy for single owner or yes. limited owner uh, firms, did you consider the, different, the potential differences in priorities in those, in those situations or time horizons that the, that the owners might be taking into account and that perhaps that made those contractual provisions less important? Okay, so the, uh, the typical investment in a, uh, in a vulture fund, um, in, these in, in, the, in the instances where, where we looked, was on the order of you know, three or five years, um, which um, you know, suggests, and, and I don't know what the, you know, when the optimal number of years, whether it's short-term, long-term investors, I don't know. Um, I know that if, if the markets are working at all uh, and I take over a company and I'm writing a CEO pay contract, and the, the typical CEO tenure now is, is like about five years, but if I'm writing a CEO pay contract, I want to write a contract which for now and forever going forward is going to get me the most value out of this company. I want them to be uh, as highly incentivized as possible. And um, I can tell you by uh, some, you know, working with two of these guys, that there was nothing they cared about more, right? I mean, obviously they cared about value of the company, things like that, but once they took over the company, that became issue number one. Who's the right person for this job? And let's give them the right incentives. Given the, exigency, the exigencies though, yeah. might, they just, might there be a tendency to overpay either <clears throat> with money or with uh, terms? So I can, under, I can understand, well, so first of all, uh, they're betting their own money and, an often, and oftentimes they're betting hundreds of millions of dollars. So you know, I'm not sure it's kind of a slapdash decision. Um, I can understand pay <clears throat> for these guys being significantly higher. I, I find it's not significantly higher, but I can imagine a story that says they don't really care. It's a very small component of the firm's value typically. Mm -hmm. I don't want to risk getting the second best guy. I'll just pay uh, maybe more. A and premium. in any event, the firm will be a price taker in the market, right? The CEO wage, Jesse's uh, suggesting that the market is sort of broken, but when you come to the market, you're buying in a broken market. So if the prices are artificially raised by other firms, you're just going to be overpaying. Yes? Right. But there's no reason that they would write, that they would deliver, let's say, the average uh, reservation wage to run a bankrupt company, which is a pretty risky thing, is, is $15 million a year. There's no reason they would have to pay that in inefficient ways. If it's inefficient to give, uh, spring-loaded options and fixed-term contracts and all these other features which I look at, sort of 12 or 15 different features in these pay contracts, I can deliver $10 million in index stock options. I might have to give you more stock options 
to make $15 million worth of index stock options. But none of these firms used index stock options, even though um, uh, the Beb, Chuck, and Fried book was out there suggesting, and, and the paper with David Walker, who's here also, suggesting index stock options were sort of self-evidently a good idea. And you, you mentioned, uh, you gave me another thought, which is that if the, if the market is uh, broken, as you described it, in, inflated um, in general, would that mute, could that mute the, uh, the effects of things like, dis you know, when you were talking about uh, not seeing results with disclosure companies, for example, uh, with respect to insider trading, would the just fundamental brokenness, potential brokenness of the market mask that? Yeah, so, so I mean, the, 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 the paper with about the 10b51 plans is consistent in a way with the Bebchuk and Freed view because here we, should, we have an example of CEOs who are manipulating disclosure to earn illegal profits. I personally don't think they should be illegal, but that's the law. Uh, and these are, this is, this is law breaking, yes? Um, so here CEOs are doing what Professor Fried suggested they were doing by writing out you know, 3,962,654. They're doing that here by manipulating disclosure, which you know I think uh, in, in America and law we sort of fetishize disclosure. You know we got a problem it's like oh disclosure, all disclosure is good. Our paper is an example. Disclosure can be a a, a, sh a sword, not just a shield. Um, so here CEOs are doing this, and then the question that I was asking in the sort of the, the follow-on uh, piece is, how do boards react? They know that CEOs are doing this. In fact. The directors are doing it too. How do boards react knowing that CEOs are earning illegal profits from their trades? And I provide some evidence, again, I don't think I've proved it, but I've provided some evidence that they very rationally say, look, if you're making more money by trading, because we've liberalized your ability to trade, we don't need to pay you as much. And so they adjust pay uh, accordingly. And again, that's just some evidence of uh, arm's length. It doesn't mean that every case is arm's length or that uh, necessarily the market is uh, uh, perfectly efficient. I have a question for Todd, and then, I'll, and then I have a question for the audience. <coughs> Since you're not asking us questions, we'll ask you questions. <laughs> uh, so the question for Todd is, um, I, I unfortunately didn't read your bankruptcy piece, but... Few have. Um, <laughs> but he'll be signing copies at <coughs> the lobby. <laughs> but... Um, in, in the, you know, when I was at UC Berkeley, I, I taught bankruptcy, and, and what I remember from bankruptcy is that companies that are in Chapter 11 have very different capital structures than typical public company. A typical public company has mostly stock outstanding. They're the residual claimants, so it makes sense to tie uh, the executive's payout to the um, uh, to the value that's received by the shareholders, and the, you know there are better ways of doing that, worse ways of doing that. In bankruptcy, you have different. You have firms that are insolvent, so the equity is often worth nothing, or maybe it has some option value. You have different levels of debt. Um, the thinking is that if you really want to incentivize somebody in bankruptcy who's running a bankrupt company to maximize the value of that entity, is that you tie their uh, you tie their uh, compensation to the payout to various classes of, of creditors at the end of the proceeding. And so the theoretically ideal way to do it is to give the managers, uh, you know, say 5% of every different type of debt. And that would incentivize them to maximize the size of the bankruptcy pie. Once the company emerges from bankruptcy, recapitalizes, um, <clears throat> uh, issues stock, then you would recontract and um, change the compensation contract of the CEO to tie their pay to, uh, to uh, uh, the value that's received by the shareholders going forward. So the contracts that you're looking at, w at what stage are these companies in? Have they, are they in Chapter 11? Have they just exited Chapter 11? Because it would be shocking to me that the optimal contract for, for an executive of a solvent company is going to be exactly the same as the executive of, a, of an insolvent company where the residual claimants are creditors. 
Uh, okay, great. So um, these are firms that are in financial distress. Uh, most of them went into Chapter 11. So some of them didn't, uh, but most of them did. Uh, and I looked at contracts. I looked at, uh, and I didn't have contracts for every single one of them. Sometimes I had different ones. So my data sample set is not always the full number of firms. Um, but uh, I looked at the contracts for the Chapter 11 process, both in amount and structure. And you're right that many of them do have this feature, which is we're going to tie your immediate pay to the outcome of the proceedings when we come through uh, Chapter 11. And it's reflected in the first day orders and, and the process of bankruptcy. Uh, and then I have their contract for the emergence. And that's usually, although not always, structured at the time that they're hired uh, when the firm is in financial distress. So in almost all these cases, there was a new CEO. When the new CEO was brought in, they were effectively handed two compensation contracts. This is what we're going to pay you to get us through the process. And here's what your contract is going to look like in the, uh, in the, in the new entity. Uh, and it was sort of a uh, on the shelf contract. And then I looked at the ones that actually were uh, implemented after the firm. And I looked at three years before distress and three years after distress, uh, after, uh, chapter, after emerging from chapter 11. So for, for the ones that I got, and I think for those, you know, it was more like on the order of 50 or so firms. I was looking at the new pay contract that was equivalent to what you'd be doing if you were IPOing, right? You're going to the market with a new company, you're saying, here's our contract going forward. And almost all of these firms had a CEO who, the CEO who was hired to lead the company through financial distress, survived until after that three year uh, period when I stopped looking in the post chapter 11 period. And what features are you looking at that you find are stable? Uh, I, I can send it to you. Uh, I, I just got it from your book. Um, um, fixed terms, uh, supplemental retirement programs, index stock options, uh, reloading of stock options, um, things like that. It's good that you're reading the book. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so then the question for the audience is, uh, I know that some of you have served on boards of public companies or advised boards of public companies or working at high levels in public companies. Um, I'm wondering whether um, Todd's characterization of the pay setting process in his insider trading paper resonates with you. Is this something that boards are doing? They're saying, okay, well, we're going to let executives make more insider trading profits, but then we're going to cut his salary by the amount by which we expect him to make more illegal insider trading profits? Is this something that resonates with people who are on public company boards or work in public companies? I think the only <laughs> <laughs> it, it wouldn't resonate with me either. I mean, uh, of course not, right? Of course a board's not going to say, uh, we know you're up to illegal activity, so therefore we're going to offset your pay. I mean, of course not. But then if you, said it, if you say it this way, which is, um, if we take away your ability to earn profits, will we pay you more? And the Rulestone study says yes, right? We restrict your ability to do something valuable. Do we have to pay you more? Of course. If we liberalize your ability to do something that's valuable, do we have to pay you less? Of course. So I'm not suggesting that in the mo you know, that the board sits down and dickers over this. If they did, they'd find themselves in big trouble because in our other paper, we show that directors are also behaving illegally. And they certainly wouldn't want to be blessing CEOs trading illegally in firm stock. But knowing that CEOs are going to do this, and again, it's not in the minds of any of the individual board members. They exist in a market. They observe this. And what we observe, the consequences of liberalizing the ability to trade is they have to pay less. Yeah. Based on the experience that um, I've had as a public company general counsel as well as a board member currently serving at a public company, um, those assumptions don't bear out. There's never been a conversation at the board level about insider <coughs> trading offsetting um, any kind of I wouldn't expect there to be. You'd go to jail. But, but it's, not even, it's not even an unstated part of the analysis. How do you know? Because we talk about the analysis. I understand that, but, in my mind. I, I understand, but I'm, I, I'm not trying to describe what happened in your boardroom, right? I've looked at 700 firms, 
and I'm saying this is what the data suggest in the same sense that I, I, I am certain at all these firms where the executives earned 24% return by entering into disclosure uh, 10B51 trading plans, the board never had a conversation about that. The CEO never had a conversation right. about that. Professor Henderson, yeah. is, it, is it possible, uh, is it possible that if th this is more of a demand-driven phenomenon, that, that, um, that if more cash is available, the perceived need through insider trading, let's say, that less is required otherwise. So that it's not necessarily an element of the bargain, but a, an element of the perceived need on the executive's part. I mean, the executive's kids have to eat oatmeal for dinner. If yeah, they right. Pay too <laughs> <little>. <laughs> I, I don't know. I have no idea what the bargain change looks like. I would be stunned if a CEO came in and said, boy, I now have the ability to trade more illegally. You need to pay me less. I'd be stunned if the board ever had a conversation about of course, it. Right? Of course, and that was, but I think. That, that, yeah, so that would, you know, of course you, you don't expect that to be observed. The question is, I'm looking at uh, 700 firms. So of right. course we're drawing inferences from a big set of data. And the question is whether or not these, um, the existence of this opportunity should influence the bargain, whether the CEO demands less so because she knows she can go to the board and say, I don't need to bargain as much with my board on this issue, how much I'm being paid next year, because I can make that money trading. I'm richer over and here. I'm already richer, and I don't, that way that will give me leverage with the board to do something else that's important. Right. right? Maybe they won't stand in the way of this merger that I want to do or whatever something else that they have. I have no idea. Yeah. And I, I, again, I'm not trying to describe what happens in boardrooms. I'm trying to describe what happens in boardrooms. No, I was just going to say, let's let Jill Fish and maybe there'll be more questions after, uh, after she's spoken. Thank you, Professor Henderson. Let's see if I can get, please bear with me. Next up is Professor Fish, University of Pennsylvania School of Law. Okay, so I have the task, I think, of pr provocateur um, because uh, Jesse said there's no debate uh, about whether CEOs are overpaid. The only question is how much. And I recognize that in the wake of his and Lucian's very influential uh, book, many people are sold on the idea that CEOs are systematically overpaid. And I'm not going to present data showing that we've got executive pay exactly right. But I at least want to raise some questions. And I want to raise some questions because um, both Jesse's book and Todd's papers focus on the process. They tell you uh, that they can analyze the process and infer from the process that there are or are not problems with executive pay levels. And at the end of the day, I'm not sure that we care about the process. I think we care about the results. And I'm not sure that I want necessarily to buy the connection that Jesse, Jesse and Lucian draw between the two. And let me give you a little bit of an analogy, right? We in academia talk a lot, I teach securities regulation as well, we talk a lot about the stock markets and stock market pricing and stock market efficiency. Now, if I go out into the stock market and look at people's trading, I find that there are some people that go to internet chat rooms and somebody that they don't even know says, oh, stock XYZ is a great company. And they go out and buy stock. The SEC for years had something on its website. There was a scam where you left a phony voicemail on somebody's answering machine. So if your name is Bill, you'd come home from work and you'd get a, a voicemail that said, hey, Harry, this is Jessica. And I'm working at this investment bank. And I just learned about this great deal. And people would go out and buy stock 
based on this phony voicemail to some, from somebody they didn't know that they got on their answering machine. And the SEC had to put the voicemail up on the website to warn investors don't buy stock on the basis of this information. So the process by which lots of people buy stock is flawed. That doesn't necessarily tell us whether the stock market is efficient, whether stock price prices are based on fundamental information, whether stock prices or the prices of publicly traded companies could be better valued better by some process other than looking at market prices. So I kind of feel the same way about executive compensation. I'm with Jesse all the way on, you know, there's some weird things that we see going on in the process for setting executive pay. And, you know, kind of a good uh, anecdote or a good uh, illustration is the Disney case, a case that at least sort of unpacks for us a lot about the pay setting process. Maybe a little bit anom anomalous in the sense that Michael Ovitz wasn't CEO. But otherwise, we saw a lot about the details. And you know, there were a lot of problems. The compensation committee you know, didn't do the world's best job. The court points out a lot of things that they could have done better. Um, and if you look at the dollar amount of Ovitz's severance package, it was extraordinarily high. But was it too high? Was Ovitz overpaid? And there, I think you have to take into account, and I went to a, a program in London uh, or in, in Oxford a few years ago, and a UK judge was looking at the overall terms of the deal. And he said, you know, look at this. Ovitz is coming not from a position as CEO of a public company, but from his own company, where he's incredibly highly paid. Right? There's got to be some trade-off. There's got to be some compensation. And he's coming to work for Disney in a position very much unlike what he's done before. Is it going to work? Who knows? He needs downside protection. He can't go back necessarily to his old job. He can't count on that. He can come out of an experience for six months or 12 months or 18 months at Disney in which he's damaged goods. <coughs> he's got to protect himself against that. And it's not just the risk of being damaged goods <coughs> because being number two at Disney didn't work. He's coming into a position with Eisner, who we all know is you know, a risky, you know, th this is not necessarily the job you want. It's kind of like being president of the United States right at the height of an economic crisis, right? You don't really know how it's going to work, how you're going to do, what you're going to be able to do afterwards. Um, so, you know, he bargains, he gets the downside protection. It turns out to be a huge amount of money. Is it too much? Hard to say. Can we infer that it's too much because there were flaws in the process? Right? I don't think so. And that, I guess, goes to Todd's point about, you know, what's the structure? How would we do this better? If we acknowledge, yes, there are flaws, but um, at the end of the day, uh, we can't come up with a less flawed system. Um, you know, should we really be uh, doing, you know, aiming the level of criticism at this that we are? So, um, Jesse and Todd look at process, but the, I think, popular outcry and the institutional investor outcry about executive compensation focuses less on process and more on outcome. And here, I think it gets pretty hard. What's our benchmark? If we all agree, if there's no debate that executives are overpaid, I want to know how we know that. What do we compare executive pay to? Todd makes fun of the fact that the New York Times compares it to uh, average worker salaries. We also see just statistics. Let's compare it to executives at some point in the past. How much was Henry Ford paid? Should you know executives today? You know, we just uh, change it to two thousand and twelve dollars, and then we've got a good comparison. Um, lower level workers, right? There's your lower level worker on uh, some sort of multiple. And Todd, I think, makes it pretty clear that's not a great benchmark. What about other people, non-executives? Uh, Steve Kaplan looks at uh, private equity or hedge fund managers. You can look at star athletes. You can look at, uh, you know, um, uh, Justin Bieber. I don't know how much he gets paid. I don't know, even though he's a highly paid entertainer, but I'm sure some of them are, right? You know, so we see headlines 
my God, this executive is getting paid millions or billions of dollars. How do we know that that's too much, right? Do we measure it in terms of social utility, productivity? Uh, one thing I think that the last four years have told us is, you know, it really does matter who the CEO is. We see companies performing, we see companies responding differently to the financial crisis, depending on who's in charge. When I started teaching 25 years ago, you know, I was kind of skeptical. You know, the CEO's a figurehead, but do they really make that much difference? How much are they just taking the company as it is, you know, and if it, they've got a great product, terrific, but do they really play a big part? Now I'm a lot less sure. I think leadership matters. I think tone at the top matters, particularly in light of today's challenges. So, you know, the fact that they get paid a lot of money, well, there are a lot of people that do who, in my mind, um, produce a lot less. Uh, executives in other countries, is that our benchmark? Um, you know, other countries have a very different regulatory structure. Other countries have a very different governance structure. And US, you know, big US public companies aren't just economically important in the US. You know, they dominate on a global basis. So you know, I'm not sure that any of these benchmarks are particularly useful in telling us, OK, you know, yeah, we can conclude. We can look at the numbers and say this is too much. It's also hard because there are a lot of different ways to measure pay. Right? If we were trying to do the comparison and say, is this number, have we gotten too high? What do we look at? We've moved to more complex pay structures, in part because, you know, as, as the, my previous panelist said, you know, um, stockholders don't li like to look and see that an executive is getting paid this huge amount in salary. So we make it performance-based. We look at stock or stock <laughs> options or severance payments or different kinds of compensation. But then it becomes more difficult. Do we have to adjust at the, t do we have to measure it at the time that the stock, op stock options are granted? Do we look at the actual exercise price, what the executive takes away? Do we look at the executive stock ownership, right? Or just the executive com executive's compensation? Is it a good pay plan if the executive brings home a dollar a year but owns a big chunk of the company? Or is that a bad compensation structure, right? Are those the executives that we worry about or not? Um, perks. You know, it used to be the case that the executive got to take the corporate jet and go play golf. And the executive got his or her country club, usually his, country club membership paid for. And the executive got a lot of stuff like that. And the SEC got increasingly stringent about requiring companies to disclose those kinds of perks. And disclosure had what might be the predicted effect of causing companies to compensate their executives less with perks. But what's the trade-off? How much more money do you have to pay an executive if you're not compensating with this sort of soft money with these perks? And the amount the dollar amount, the value of the perks, might not themselves be substantial. The trade-off, the shift to cash or bonuses or stock options, like the shift from salary to contingent pay, has the effect of driving up overall compensation levels. Right, there's the corporate jet, yes. It turned out, by the way, that the executives who got to use the company jet had lower golf handicaps. <laughs> Somebody did a study. Um, do we measure pay in relation to the hours worked? Right? The CEO's job has changed over time. Right? There's a lot more you have to do. You have to spend all that time now after Dodd-Frank reviewing, after Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, reviewing internal controls and signing off on the company's financial statements and things like that. Uh, I'm not aware of a study that keeps track and correlates to see whether executive pay levels have increased relative to overall demands of the job. Right? That, that, that's the CEO whose demand, job demands have gotten too high. Right? And finally, risk adjusted, and I kind of alluded to this before, right? look at the shift from salary to options or from salary to stock. Right? I'm, a, I'm an executive. I have to be compensated to bear that risk. And we were talking uh, just before the session about the shift from options to holding stock and about the lack of diversification 
that big stock holdings impose on corporate executives. Right? You've got all, you know, we can talk about the incentives that that uh, creates for decision making. But from the perspective of, ex of an executive and on, on the issue of incentives, you know, I'm thinking Dick Fold held a lot of stock. Right? So, so far as I can tell, he didn't run Lehman in a particularly risk averse manner. So, I, you know, just one example doesn't really tell you anything, but just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps less worried about that dampening of risk-taking incentives. But I am worried about the fact that if the executive is at the hypothetical bargaining table that Jesse tells me he's not, if he's there, or if I'm representing him, I'm going to say, look, you want my, my client to take this pay package, you've got to up the overall value, right? That's the trade-off. Right, finally, and again, I've kind of, kind of been alluding to this, has the job of the CEO changed? Yes. I think there's no question. Um, it's changed in a lot of ways. The CEO has to be on top of a lot of issues. It's changed in terms of accountability, right? Institutional investors today make demands, play a role, scrutinize business decisions. The press, the financial media reacts almost immediately, criticizes what the company does, right? You've got to cover your bases a lot more carefully up front. Right? Regulation, I talked about, imposes demands. Uh, CEOs are at the helm, at the top, for a ever-shortening period of time. Right? The average uh, CEO term is roughly five years. Right? Didn't used to be the case. And the CEO's um, uh, non-financial rewards, I think, have changed as well. I, I think there was a time I'm just going to skip paper for performance. We talked a little bit about that. I think there was a time when, as CEO, you were really personally identified with the company. And you personally did identify, right? You were building a company for the long term. And part of what you got out of being CEO was this idea, he's the CEO of this company. I think today, that's less true. Uh, yes, CEOs win a tournament after many years to get to that top spot. And I'm focusing on CEOs here because there's other literature showing that when we're worried about executive pay, we're mostly worried about the CEO, right? Lucian has other work in which he says, you know, the, the, the piece of the pie, the piece of the executive pay pie that the CEO gets is an ever increasing share, right? CEO's one person, right, wins this tournament, works for years, gets this position that they're not in for very long, in which a lot now of the benefit has become financial, in part because of regulation, because of disclosure requirements, because of shareholder scrutiny. Now, that may or may not be a good thing. We might like the idea that the firm is some legacy, that you're really nurturing the firm over time, but that's a kind of less market-based approach. So I'm not here sort of criticizing or defending this shift in culture. All I'm saying is if this shift, in fact, has occurred, it's not surprising that we see big dollars today. Right? We're, we're telling CEOs that's what you're supposed to get out of it. And that's not inconsistent with the sort of trend we see, the populist trend that we see outside of the public company arena. Right? If you look at what goes on on Wall Street, if you look at what goes on in financial firms, right, it's consistent with the same trend. Right? Finally, um, To the extent that you think the um, question or the debate about excessive executive compensation is about the market process, I think today what we see more than ever is a shift from the firm to the market as a source of executive talent. Now, we can talk about whether the market is efficient, whether the market is broken. But these days, a CEO doesn't necessarily pay his dues, rise from within, and eventually reach the level of the leader of his or her own company that he's helped build. 
right? Today, there's a lot more of a lateral market for CEO positions. And with a lateral market comes a natural check on some of the abusive results that we infer from these problematic processes, right? We don't have a particularly good way of negotiating executive pay. But at the same time, we have market forces. And market forces takes me back to internet chat rooms, right? Is it really possible to systematically have CEOs paid too much or too little? Well, yes, we can have market bubbles, right? We can have prices that are wrong in some sort of fundamental value sense, right? But by and large, those same market forces are going to adjust anomalous, egregious practices because there are people who can come in to the corporate market, to the market for executive talent, and impro impose pressure on processes that systematically produce the wrong result. Right? And so at the end of the day, unless you come up with a better process than the market, right, I'm not sure that it makes sense to call for widespread reform, even if you identify process-based problems that you might be able to tinker with. And I should just say in closing, we've been trying to do this for a long time. Right? As long as I've been in teaching, We've been looking at executive pay, the process for setting executive pay, the disclosures of executive pay, and everywhere along the line where we've tried to impose some regulatory fix, there's at least an argument that it's made things worse, <coughs> right? The limits on deductibility, tax deductibility of straight salary, uh, the move to performance-based compensation, the uh, various uh, modifications to the disclosure requirements, executive pay consultants, are all examples of efforts to fix a broken process. And we could be all he here all day debating whether those reforms have worked. But I think there is at least an argument that you know, sort of focusing on something, you know, some, some little move that you can make is not necessarily going to lead you at the end of the day with a better process or a better overall market. And I'll stop there. Can I make one comment? Uh, so uh, one natural reaction is to say that who cares if Jesse's wrong? Because if he's wrong and, you know, we end up paying CEOs a little bit less of public companies, you know, it's not the end of the world. I think there is a cost, though, that's a significant cost related to what uh, Jill was saying. Uh, and there's two things that can happen, uh, or one thing that can happen, and I'll give you two examples. Um, CEOs can go, CEOs of public companies can go work other places. Uh, and if we value getting... Uh, top people into the leadership positions of uh, public companies, then uh, that could be a se serious loss. So last year, the top 25 hedge fund managers in the United States, each individually made NAT themselves a billion dollars. A billion dollars, right? The average CEO makes uh, 10, 12 million dollars a year. So there is a market on Wall Street that we're not talking about here in which people are rewarded with incredibly outsized pay. And if I'm a CEO of a public company, you say, okay, well, we're going to subject you to all this scrutiny. If you, you can go to jail for signing the financial statement under Sarbanes-Oxley, everything about your whole life's going to be disclosed, and all this, and I, and I can go and make more money on Wall Street, then I might go into the financial sector. And that could be a serious, uh, seriously negative thing, especially if we think the financial sector in the United States has gotten too big, a, too big of a part of our GDP. We're pushing talent there because we're squeezing on it over here. The other thing uh, CEOs could do, uh, if there is this market that uh, Jill talked about that's a little bit more mixed, is go work for private companies. There were some famous anecdotes in the last few years of CEOs, or, or, uh, top level talent who'd come up through General Electric or other breeding grounds for CEOs who went and worked for private firms that no one had ever heard of instead of taking public company jobs because they could pay more. There wasn't as much outrage. There wasn't as much public scrutiny. And that's also a significant loss if we think there's value in having uh, publicly traded companies. So if you think that public traded companies are important in the United States for a variety of uh, reasons, then I think that's another significant uh, cost of getting this wrong. <laughs>
So, um, question for, uh, for Jill and Jesse, I guess. So, Jill, so you're, you know, you're focusing on, should we be focusing on results, right, instead of the process? But, you know, any kind of external benchmark, uh, I agree, is, is kind of useless. I mean, the reason I think that we've been focusing on process is that ultimately the question is whether, uh, what's the benchmark? The benchmark is, well, what would executives be paid in a well-functioning market? Now, that brings you to the question, I guess, is, well, can we, what is a well-functioning market? Can we do any better than the market we have? I'm not sure. I, I tend to think those are two different questions. But clearly, the, we can't look at the result simply compared to film stars or average workers. I mean, that, that's not going to work, right? I mean, what we're after is a a market result, and the question is whether we're getting a reasonable market result with the current process. I think that's why everybody focuses on process. But that brings me back to Jesse's talk, which, Jesse, you know, obviously, uh, I share a lot of your views here. But, you know, your, your, your discussion would have been spot on 10 years ago, right? The question is, there's a lot that's changed. And, and I guess in your view, maybe not that much has changed. But CEOs are off nominating committees, right? There is a lot more independence. Compensation committees are reporting to, sorry, consultants are reporting to the compensation committees. CEO pay has been pretty flat over the last 10 years. Of course, the market's been flat too. So, but, but, so I think that all comes together because the question would be, sure, there's, a, there's, there's managerial power. There are also market forces at work. How do we know when the problem is fixed well enough that we can worry about other things, right? How, I mean, sh there's always going to be an element of market, of, of managerial power. Are we close <clears throat> enough, right? Have we resolved the process issues sufficiently that there's not that much left at stake? So, I mean, I think that um, you're right about sort of the question you posed to me, except that I think it works in the other direction. I think what we do is we make these comparisons as a basis for claiming executive pay is too high. Look, executives are getting paid more than rock stars. Executives are getting paid so and so much times the average worker's pay, or so much more than they were paid in uh, however many years ago, or so much more than they're paid in Europe. And that tells us that CEO pay is too high. And the response then is, well, it's, there's a market for executive talent, and so why should we assume just because these numbers are large that it's too much, right? So that is then the motivation for Jesse's work, saying, well, no, if it's not actually a competitive market, if it's dominated by these process failures and managerial power and all of that, we can't trust the market. Right? But that doesn't mean we infer the opposite, right? That kind of reasoning is flawed to say, well, yeah, if the market was good, we wouldn't worry about pay. The market might not be so good, therefore, pay is excessive, right? You can't make that step. And that's all I'm saying here, right? You know, we, we, we went down this whole road by observing that executive salaries were too high at a time uh, you know, kind of uh, surprisingly, when they were a lot lower, right? We started getting upset from a PR perspective and saying, you know, gee, this is a governance problem that needs to be fixed. And in fixing it, I think we exacerbated it. Yeah, so um, I'm going to respond to uh, David's question and then also something that Todd said. So. Uh, David says that, yeah, you know, I like what you say. It would have been right 10 years ago, which coincidentally is when David and I were <laughs> writing this stuff. Um, <clears throat> but uh, things have changed. CEOs are off nominating committees. CEO pay is flat. I do think that things have changed over the last 10 years. All I think due to your work, too. Well. I mean, you uh, can't make that claim. I can make that claim. Thank you. Uh, um, I... I, I I mean, there are many people who have been critical of executive pay, and um, I'm sure that even if the book that I wrote with Lucian Bebchek had not been written, you know, the world would be very similar to the way it is now. I do think that managers, um, I think that manager, manager's power has declined. I think that the portion of executive pay, if you were to try to break it into sort of a, you know, 
an arm's length piece and a managerial power piece, probably the portion that's attributable to managerial power has declined um, over the last 10 years. We have majority voting in a lot of companies now. We have fewer staggered boards. Directors are feeling more heat. We can see that because the turnover of executives is faster. Um, we have say on pay, which is not perfect, and um, you know it's, the kinks are still being worked out, but I think that does put additional pressure on boards to try to get things right. Um, but <clears throat> I think that managerial power still influences the level and the uh, composition of executive pay. Uh, I think it's still uh, too high and it's still not sufficiently tied to performance for the reasons that I elaborated in my presentation. The directors who are negotiating these deals are not paying with their own money. They have various incentives to please the CEO. Um, there are all sorts of social and psychological factors that uh, make it difficult for them, absent some pressure from the outside to push back against the CEO who cares about every dollar that he's getting. And I think it's uh, worth continuing to uh, move in the direction of giving shareholders more power. There are still lots of companies with staggered boards. I think that through a process of private ordering, those boards should be destaggered so that directors are exposed to annual elections. I think that through a process of private ordering, shareholders should push for majority voting so that if a director does not get a majority of the votes cast in election, he leaves the board. Right now, um, most directors who do not get a majority of the votes cast stay on the board. If directors, if, if directors do such a bad job that shareholders aren't happy, they should leave. So I don't think that at this point, shareholders have the optimal amount of power. I think they need more, and the more power they have, the less managerial power will influence the pay setting process and um, other corporate governance decisions. As to Todd's point about being concerned about managers fleeing to hedge funds, as I understood Todd, what he's saying is that if we put more burdens on CEOs, like we make them fill out more forms or we, we um, say more nasty things about them in, uh, in the media, that they're going to all of a sudden give up and flee for billion dollar hedge fund jobs on Wall Street. And I just don't find that plausible. Because if you're making $10 million a year now, uh, even if you don't have to fill out any paperwork, if you could get a job running a hedge fund and making a billion dollars a year, you would take it. You would increase your compensation a hundredfold. So it really has nothing to do with the amount of pressure we put on these people. The fact of the matter is these are two very different jobs. Being able to run a hedge fund and figure out how to deploy billions of dollars of capital on a short-term basis is very different from running a big company. And I don't think that we have to worry about these people throwing up their hands in disgust, abandoning their corporations and running off to um, uh, Connecticut and New York to run big hedge funds. You don't think compensation practices affect people's business when they leave business school, the choices of what industry they choose? Because if you go to the Booth School in Chicago, the top uh, employers are Goldman Sachs, not Ford Motor Company. And that has to do with the fact that people make more money on Wall Street than they do in American public yeah. companies. But I don't think that... I'm not saying, you know, the head of uh, Avon is going to go and run a hedge fund, but it's going to influence people's choices in the long run. Yeah, I think it's unfortunate that uh, finance pays so well because I do think it saps a lot of talent from, um, from companies that are actually making things and, you know, and providing, ser providing services of real value. Finance does provide some service of real value, but I think that the compensation <laughs> is the compensation is <laughs> way out of whack. But but the question is whether talent is going to migrate from operating companies to hedge funds because you know because compensation committees are tougher in terms of how they bargain. I'm not saying that CEOs should be paid less than what they're worth. In fact, they're not going to take the job if they're going to be paid less than what they're worth. I think that there should be arm's length bargaining in these companies, just like there is in these hedge funds, where the hedge funds have to go to institutional investors and say, here's the arrangement we want. We want to get paid 2 and 20. 
you know, take it or leave it. And there's real arm's length bargaining and the billion dollar compensation that emerges out of that comes from arm's length bargaining where everybody is, you know, sophisticated and, um, and um, um, to, to a more or less extent uh, bargaining with their own money. Same thing with managers fleeing to private companies. There aren't that many big, sexy private companies that would be fun to be a, um, to be a CEO of. And so I'm not really worried about the CEO of Boeing saying, oh, I'm going to go work for some other company in Seattle or Chicago or whatever that's private so I don't have to deal with all this media scrutiny. I think this, this risk is overstated. Professor Dan. Um, yeah, um, Jesse has talked about client directors. Uh, first of all, if that is indeed a problem, it should affect a lot of areas of corporate policy and not just executive compensation. Um, uh, Todd uh, said it's uh, the status quo is better than having uh, executive compensation set by academics uh, or uh, judges. Uh, and uh, Jill uh, mentioned the alternative of more regulation. Uh, but I don't think those are the only alternatives. As Jesse suggested, the uh, uh, alternative may be uh, more effective shareholder involvement in corporate governance. And I'll give you an example I've been uh, looking at. In uh, Sweden today, uh, the board of directors is selected, is nominated, and, uh, and invariably uh, elected. Uh, by a committee dominated by the four largest shareholders of the company. And Sweden requires a shareholder vote of 90% to approve executive compensation, but they almost never have a problem getting it because shareholders perceive that the directors are chosen to serve their interests and it's not a, an unresponsive uh, board uh, under the control of the CEO. Uh, so my question is, isn't Jesse right that the solution is more shareholder control and indeed wouldn't it be best if we followed Sweden and simply had the uh, directors nominated <coughs> by the largest shareholders? So we've got a, a proposal uh, which is again an academic uh, suggesting a self-evidently way of maximizing firm value and yet when we observe, well okay, it's a, fine, that's fine, it's an example of a company somewhere that people know about that uh, is an easy way to maximize firm value, and yet we don't see any companies doing it. If I was a venture capital company, everybody in share in Sweden's happy that's fine. With it. That's fine. If I'm a if I'm a, a venture capitalist in California, and I'm taking my company public, and this is an obvious way of getting shareholders to part more willingly with their money because this is a better corporate governance improvement, we would we would see it happening. We would see people innovating. They're 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 leaving money on the table by designing governance systems which shareholders would be willing to pay less money for. So I, I, you know, I'm not, I have no idea what the best corporate governance system is, but if I look out and on the world in, in, you know, in the US, in our system, given our constraints of our uh, system, and I don't see people doing it, and I see people just leaving money on the table, it makes me scratch my head and say, well, why? Why aren't they doing this? Why hasn't any company in the United States adopted this 90% rule or this, uh, this uh, you know, board voting system. And maybe one answer is, I don't know anything about Swedish companies or Swedish institutional investors, but I think if I were a venture capitalist in the United States, I'd be worried about the institutional investors that would be sitting at the table sure. and having these discussions. One, I would be worried about their incentives and their conflicts and so forth. But more importantly, I'd be worried about their ability to get it right. Now, you know, the move to stock options was largely at the urging of institutional investors. Now, there were a lot of reasons for executives to embrace the move, and Jesse has pointed some of them out, but institutional investors were the big force in favor of stock options. And it turned out that stock options, at least the way they've been used, have a lot of problems. I didn't see those institutional investors, you know, 20 years ago, identifying those problems. So, you know, I guess I'd just be a little bit concerned that even if they're really trying to do the right thing, and even if they're sophisticated people, you know, these are complicated issues. If they get it wrong, you know. I just uh, one uh, quick response to Todd. Uh, 
actually the swedes are pushing their corporate governance system to investors saying why invest in the u s where you have no power and you get abused why not come and invest here where uh, where uh, where you'll have power and everybody's very happy with the system well they did the the, the economy did the, the the corporate economy did very well through the uh, uh, through the uh, downturn so it's interesting that you know i'm i'm again i don't know whether this is an improvement or not but um there are the the cross-country comparisons are always very difficult so there was a great chart in the economist magazine last week that showed the um uh in sweden and comparing sweden and the united states and the number of large firms and the decade in which they were created and if you look at sweden most of the large firms in sweden were created in 1900 and most of the large firms in the united states were created in like the 1970s and 1980s so this there's just a it's a completely different you know we we sort of thrive on creative destruction you know the firm like facebook will be gone in three years and there'll be something else and sweden has a very different model which is you know these large family-owned businesses that have lasted forever i don't know which of those is like the obvious social welfare maximizing strategy but I just worry about transplanting something from a completely different country as successful as it might be in that country and bringing it into the U.S. Again, I'm not saying it's not a good idea. I just worry that no one in the U.S. thinks it's a good idea. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Jesse and I kind of agree and kind of, kind of don't agree, but I think we could play nicely together in this space. Um, you know, there's not much data here today, and I think, and I, and I, you know, I've been in board meetings and have done these things, and you know, you sort of see the shenanigans that that, that go on, and you kind of wonder how big is the dead weight loss, which is going to exist. And I think this was Jill's point: how big is big, and would you know it if you saw it? You know, that, that kind of thing. Um, it's an empirical issue about um, how much power actually plays into it. And just a side issue: I'm pretty sure that Murphy and Kaplan would object to your characterization of their sentences <laughs> in, the sense, in, the, in the following sense, that they'll, they'll agree that power is part of it, and I think that's a shift from you know, 20 years ago, but I don't believe they think it's the fundamental part that's causing the, the pay levels. I don't either. Yeah, he said just a little bit. I don't either. A okay. small victory. But I guess, but, <laughs> but small victory. I, 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 I totally agree with their characterization. Yeah, yeah. but, but I, I guess I want to push on that. The deadweight loss, I don't know how big it is. It'd be a great study to do. It's kind of a Nobel Prize winning study if you could kind of figure that out. What's the benchmarking thing? But I mean, we know relatively that the, the power part of it, assuming we can measure it, and I think we'd all agree it's not clear how to, how to do this, it's a nit in terms of the explanatory power and the level of pay. Um, and so it's not zero, it's positive, but it's small. If we had no data, why do you say it's a nit? Because my 99 paper nails down <laughs> the knit size of it. Yeah. How, wow. how, much, how much do you, what, what's your... I don't know, there's data from the 80s. Yeah, but, so, but, but yeah. you know, that's data from the 80s before the pay explosion, and no one empirical paper can nail down anything. I mean, you I, know, I, unless you're doing a randomized study, because it's very hard to control for all sorts of omitted variables. You need to have lots of studies cutting at the data differently with different methodologies over different time periods. Um, it's, a, it's a judgment question. And, you know, you may think it's like, well, it's fairly small. I'm not making, since I'm, I'm, I try to be data-driven myself, I'm not making a claim as to the magnitude. My sense is it's not a nit. It's, it's, it's more than a nit. It's something that people should care about. But whether they're overpaid by 20% or 40% on average, I don't know. I'm sure there are many CEOs out there who, because of their power, are overpaid by 100% because they shouldn't be CEOs of their companies. They should have been fired, but they're not because the people on the board, you know, have ties to them. And, you know, those types of people may be destroying lots of value for shareholders. But those are doable studies. I think, well, I'll just make a kind of a, I think we're, we're coming to the end. A couple of minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, um, I think everything that uh, just occurred to me sitting here thinking about my own pay, which I just found out about, um, I think everything that Jesse said about uh, CEO pay and managerial power could also explain faculty pay. Um, you've got a similar sort of dynamic that the D, I mean, we make less, but we're probably overpaid. Um, most law faculty do nothing. Uh, and um, 
<laughs> and that's that's been <laughs> yeah well th that's that's been that's been widely documented and uh, uh, Todd I, I can't I can't go on another panel with you yeah <laughs> <laughs> the reminder that uh, uh, you know you can you can criticize my work right you know <laughs> oh you you're underpaid I'm, I think you're underpaid but I think the average oh, okay. faculty member is, right, is overpaid and uh, you know they've got influence on the dean and. The students are this dispersed group. They're paying. The government subsidizing this. I mean, I think you could you could tell a very similar story uh, about uh, faculty pay. So faculty power may be my next uh, best-selling book. Maybe I can be as famous as. Please Jesse. don't write it. Yeah, right. Please don't write it. <laughs> I think there's a question over here. Yes. <laughs> the president of the United States. So it, there, there are, as, as Professor Fish mentioned, there are some non-monetary perks to being the president of the well, United States. <laughs> did you, and being the president did you, of Ohio did you State. See his, yeah. Did you see his corporate jet, the president's? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have just one corporate jet. He's got like 10. And, and so, they're the biggest corporate jets in the world. So it's, a, it's an interesting question. So the, the government uh, of Singapore pays their uh, government officials a lot more than our government does. Um, a minister, the treasury secretary in Singapore makes about three million U.S. dollars a year with the idea that we want to attract the best people. Um, I think the way we do it in the United States uh, is obviously you're not going to attract the best people to be president or to be treasury secretary or a Supreme Court justice makes $200,000 a year. You're not going to be able to uh, attract the best people. So we pay you later, right? We pay you by, you know, Bill Clinton. He was penniless. He never had a public job in his life. He lived in the governor's mansion in the White House. He's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Al Gore, vi uh, vice president of the United States, worth hundreds of millions of dollars now. Uh, George W. Bush, I mean, they, you can go, as soon as the president uh, leaves, whether it's in a month or in four, four and a half years, he'll make hundreds of millions of speaking and doing all these things. So it's just deferred compensation for our uh, government officials, Tim Geithner and people who work as uh, regulators. That may be worse in one way, in the sense that you encourage people to please people after the fact by doing things while you're in office. So this is the kind of revolving door story. So there, I think there is something to this. Yeah, or how much do you pay your football coach, right? right? <laughs> I think these are uh, questions for another panel. <laughs> and, uh, and, and well, speaking of which, we although this has been a terrific first panel for this symposium, it's uh, we, we do have to stay somewhat on schedule. So I'd like to thank Professor Fish, Fried, and Henderson. Really wonderful. Uh, and also thank Mitch Thompson for doing a good job as moderator. And uh, the most important piece of information now is that the restrooms are in that direction, and uh, we'll reconvene at eleven o'clock. Thank you.